Thanks for tuning in to Telecast. Before you listen to the show, I wanted to let you know about Telecast's new sister brand, The Drop. The Drop is a free weekly newsletter and website dedicated to the digital first content business. Every Friday, we feature a roundup of the week's key news stories in the sector, plus an exclusive feature interview with one of the leaders in the creator economy. So, for news and insights into the new wave of social first entertainment, sign up for free at dropmedia.co.uk. That's dropmedia.co.uk. Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. My guest this week is CEO of UK-based production group Argonon, and author of a new business book, The Flexible Method, Prepare to Prosper in the Next Global Crisis. Welcome to Telecast, James Burstall. How are you doing, James? I'm really well, thank you. It's not too often that TV execs publish books, so I'm really looking forward to delving into that a little bit later on in the show. But first of all, let's start with you and your background in TV, James. Tell us how you first got started in the world of content and television. Well, I started out as a journalist when I was at university. In my fourth year, I did modern languages. In my fourth year, I suddenly thought, oh my God, I, I'm going to need to earn some money sometime soon. So I did kind of what I've done actually throughout my life is I just wrote hundreds of letters and emails and uh, got loads of rejections, of course. And then I was offered a job as a very junior editorial assistant, earning next to nothing, but on a magazine in Paris called Paris Passion. It seemed like a great opportunity, one, to go back and live in Paris, and two, to get into journalism. And in fact, what happened on the day I arrived was they said, "Um, well, look, it's great that you've arrived, but we're sorry to say that the magazine is really struggling and may very well go out of business shortly. So what we're going to ask you, and there was Alain de Botton there and a whole bunch of other, other young things, what they said to us is, that, can you put the magazine together because many of our senior editors are leaving? It's a bit like Time Out, this magazine. So then for the next three months, we literally decided what stories we were going to tell. We went and did the interviews. We wrote the stories. We did the layout. We took the photographs. We did the whole shebang. And in fact, it was incredible. So by the end of three months, I had this really dense portfolio of material. Again, with this kind of belief that if you don't ask, you don't get I put word around that um, I was looking for a job. In the Herald Tribune, an ad popped up looking for an editorial assistant who spoke languages to come and work for Condé Nast, which obviously is the huge publishing house based in New York, which publishes everything from Vanity Fair to Condé Nast Traveller to Vogue, Tatler, etc. And so then I went on and I had a career working for the three giants of British media, all based in New York, Harold Evans, Tina Brown and Anna Winter. So it was the most incredible baptism with fire. And my goodness, I learned a lot working for those guys. Um, I stayed in Paris for about five years. And of course, as a, as a sort of young 20-something, it was an amazing opportunity because I get a phone call from New York at 10 in the morning saying, do you mind just jumping on a plane and going to Vienna this afternoon? <laughs> I'm like, that's no problem. So uh, I did really enjoy it. And then there came a point when I thought, actually, I don't want to be a stringer anymore. You know, the head office for those mag- magazines was obviously in New York. And I thought, I really want to be in head office. I want to be part of the decision-making process. I applied for jobs back in the UK, and I got a job working initially as a commissioning editor for Tatler magazine, for Emma Soames, who at that time was trying to turn it into Vanity Fair because it was struggling a bit. So I went and worked for her for a bit. And then um, I was lured across for my sins to the Daily Mail, where I worked as, uh, in features. So I was picking up on quite gritty news stories and, and learning. I mean, they're amazing. They taught me to write a 1,000 words a day. And then after having done that for a while, I think I I got a little bit tired of just black and white. I wanted to move into um, music and sound and light and colour and working in a team, actually. So I thought perhaps I should move across to television. And at that point, Janet Street Porter was running Def 2, which was obviously very innovative on BBC Two. She had a slot between 6 and 8 p.m. doing shows like Rough Guide to the World, Dance Energy with Normski and a whole bunch of other big shows. And they said to me, Um, listen, you've got no experience in television whatsoever, but that doesn't matter. You know how to tell a story. And in fact, the first thing they did was they gave me a camera and said, look, go up to Glasgow with this camera and shoot a week of racism 
I got to Glasgow and it was deep snow and I didn't know how to white balance because I'd never actually held a camera before. But I did learn quite quickly on the job how to white balance. And then I made actually what was a really punchy and quite a disturbing film. I spent the week with a, a young guy called Fahim. You know, we had dog excrement thrown at us and there was, you know, the BMP was really big at that time and it was really brutal. So I made that film and uh, learned a big lesson, actually, is that I didn't shoot enough cutaways. So when we got back to the edit, I didn't realise that, of course, to cut a film together, you need lots of linking shots. So I never, ever, ever made that mistake again. <laughs> um, but the film went out and I, and I really got a taste for TV. And I stayed then in television, I worked my way up through the ranks, working as a producer-director and as a series producer. And then in my mid-30s, I think I realised that having done everything from big current affairs shows with Dermot Manahan, um, Dorothy Byrne was my boss for a while, doing a big current affairs show for ITV, also some big documentaries about climate change for BBC Two, plus a feature doc about music with the NME and filming with incredible bands because I'm really into music. I think I realised that I wanted to get into development and I kind of wanted not to be constantly on the road. I was in my mid-30s by then. Uh, and I'm, to be honest, I am a generalist. I love producing entertainment. I love producing documentary. I'm really into drama. Um, and I thought that if I get into development, maybe I can set up my own business and continue to do all of those things, but somewhat you know, more under my own steam rather than working for other people. So that was really the beginning of me running my own companies. You're obviously a boss of Argonon Group, but it was Leopard TV, I think. Was that your startup, essentially? Yeah, I mean, I worked for two different production companies as head of development. One was Flame with Roger Bolt and Barbara Artunian. I did that for a year. And then September Films with David Green and Sally Miles. And, and both were really different. Obviously, Roger is a very credible documentary producer, extremely well-networked, and I learned a lot from him. And then September Films were obviously huge in the US at this time. This is like the end of the 90s. And I wanted to learn about international distribution, and Sally Miles was absolutely one of the beasts of international distribution and you know amazingly talented woman I wanted to learn from her too so I worked for those guys and then I realized that I did know how to create ideas and sell ideas really at that point I thought well I, I need to set up my own business so I set up Leopard Films in 2001 the first commission we won was from the BBC which was called Monstrous Bosses and How to Be One because I'd learned along the way that you know there are ways to run a business and ways not to run a business so uh, quite often the difficult experiences are more illuminating than the easy ones. Now, that's interesting. That sort of links your past and present. And so Leopard Films, what was your focus then as a new business? What sort of sector of content did you want to focus on? Well, first and foremost, I knew it had to be international. You know, that access, UK, US, was absolutely critical. There are, you know, some great buyers here in the UK, but there's not enough, frankly, to run a business. You need to be international. So I always knew that I wanted to have a US base as well as UK. So we did that really from the get-go. And we also had a distribution business from the get-go because, you know, we've got this incredible terms of trade, which the, the, the last Labour government brought in, which has transformed the UK and made it an absolute go-to hotspot on the planet for intellectual property creation. I'd learned a lot, obviously, from September films on how to do distribution. So really, I knew that I wanted the business to, to do a number of things. To run a successful production company, you have to have long-running returning series. That's the absolute you know, but baseline, you've got to have long running returning series. So very early on, we were lucky enough to win a number of shows in that space. There was Cash in the Attic, there was Missing on the BBC that was commended in the House of Commons. We found a lot of people on that show. It was amazing. Also spin-offs on Channel 4, like Natural Born Dealers, uh, then Thunder Races, which was a big, big show on Discovery. And I also knew that to run a hub where very talented A-listers want to work, you have to do signature work. So I always knew that I wanted to do shows that would be much more challenging and kind of cut across. So, you know, again, really from the get-go, we did some very difficult documentary investigative work. We looked at the Aryan Brotherhood in the US, for example. We brought together the Elvis mob. You know, we found all of Elvis's cohorts and brought them together. There are some amazing stories, some of which, of course, appear now in the movie. And so, so it's really by having that kind of mixed ecology that one, we were able to run a sustainable business, but also attract really the best talent in the industry. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about people. I love working with talented people. And as the years have gone by, you know, we've been able to attract some extraordinary people and give people space. You know, for me, the reason for setting up a production company was to create an environment where very brilliant people can come and spread their wings and do their best work. 
And I love that. For me, that's the best bit of my job. And so how did Argonon Group come about then? And where does Leopard Films still sit within that? Does that still exist as its own imprint, if you like? Tell us about the formation of Argonon Group, uh, a little bit about its constituent parts. So I ran Leopard for 10 years. And, you know, when you're running a production company, you are a bit of a lone wolf. I obviously had some amazing people who worked with me. You know, if anything went wrong, it was my responsibility to make sure I could put it right. And that was right for those first 10 years. And then as, you know, we got to the credit crunch at the end of the, uh, the noughties, and I did have some people offering to buy the business. And I thought about that very seriously. One offer came along, which was, would we like to do a reverse takeover of them? And, and I could then become a chief exec, if you like, of a, of a group. And that appealed to me because I really liked the idea of broadening out our spectrum and collaborating with some very brilliant peers. But actually, I took some advice from people at the time who said, look, you don't probably want to do the deal with that particular group because, you know, there's, there's issues over there that you don't want to have to deal with. Why don't you do this anyway? Take the idea, but do it under your own steam. So I had some good advisors. I've always been really, you know, really open to surrounding myself with good people who will tell me stuff that I don't necessarily want to hear, but which is useful and, and I need to hear sometimes. Anyway, on this occasion, I had some advisors who said, let's talk to Barclays. Let's see if they'll support you, support this idea of a new group. And lo and behold, they said they would. So it was really at that point that I thought, well, let's create a new group, which is going to be a new ecosystem of very brilliant, creative people who can work collaboratively. Let's build a structure into this group, which is going to be quite different from some of the other big groups. It's not going to be granular where all the individual entities are kind of in competition with each other and don't talk and don't really care if they do well. I want it to be collegiate. And we're going to build into the structure a, a setup whereby everybody who are the key founders or the key players that join the group are stakeholders in the business, shareholders or share option holders. So there's a real sense that we're on a common journey together and we've all got skin in the game. And that appealed to a lot of people, you know, producers, directors, executive producers, now writers, actors, we all know that when we create intellectual property, we have value and we want to feel valued and we want to build value. Why would we just allow one or two giants to own everything? Why can't we be part of the action as well? So that really appealed to a lot of players. And then over the course of the, the next 10 years, you know, I set up this group that was designed to be multi-genre, multi-territory, a truly hyper-converged super indie. To a point, it's now a group of nine companies. Windfall, obviously, uh, produced science and technology program, multi-award winning all over the world. Bandicoot is a joint venture we set up with Derek and Dan, two very smart producers, produced The Masked Singer. Leopard Films has actually morphed into Studio Leo, as it's now called, run by a very brilliant lifestyle producer called Claire Collinson-Jones. Um, she's just recently brought back Cash in the Attic, for example. Leopard Pictures is our drama company, which produced Wurzel Gummidge with Mackenzie Crook and Hard Sell on Netflix with Catherine Tate. A Leopard USA, which is a lifestyle company, produces the long-running series House Hunters International and many other things. And then also we've set up, we've, we've invested in the middle of COVID actually in a branded content company uh, called Nemarin. And we're very excited about diversification into branded. It's interesting. We've been having big meetings recently with some of the major players in the branded content space. AFP is, is on the rise. You know, there are pressures on budgets all over the world. In the US and in many parts of Europe, AFP is probably more advanced than it is here in the UK. Pete Ferguson, who runs Nemerin, and we've done a big project around the company Nemerin to bring in some amazing new talent. And we're working closely with some really big agencies now to produce branded content. So it's covering most of the key sectors within content as a whole. You've, you've, it's obviously a very wide-ranging business. Now, when all of us came across this thing called COVID-19 a few years ago. I think a lot of people have actually blanked it from their memory in terms of exactly how long ago it was. But it was, uh, yeah, 2020 in about three years ago when the first lockdown happened. Now, you've obviously created a group, a group structure. You're steering this ship with lots of different types of businesses who, you know, will be affected by COVID in different ways. You know, drama producers going to be affected more or in a different way than unscripted, for example. And But there was that lockdown where production stops. Talk us through that experience of running Argonon through the COVID crisis and keeping that ship afloat and point in the right direction. 
Well, I wrote the book, The Flexible Method, um, to try to highlight some of the learnings that we have kind of formalized, if you like, through COVID. We've had a crisis management plan ever since the credit crunch back in 2008-9, and we've honed that and developed that, and we really put it into action when COVID came along. I mean, one of the things we did is that we prepared the company to be ready for crises. And we, we live in a state of perma crisis. You know, we've already seen more since COVID. We've got Ukraine, we've got the inflation crisis, we've got the banking collapse, we've got recessions potentially just around the corner. Unfortunately, this is the world that we live in, but it doesn't have to be gloom and doom. And I'm absolutely no pessimist, quite the opposite. I'm an optimist because I know that there are ways to survive these things. The first thing is you need to prepare. So you must have disaster recovery plans in place. You must get your team on board. You must build into your organization a flexible mindset. You've got to be willing to pivot and be agile and to think flexibly and think outside of the box. And the reason actually the entertainment business, particularly the independent production sector, is such a good test case, if you like, for crisis management, is that we, we're used to running very tight margin businesses We're used to pivoting on the spot. We're used to thinking laterally. We're used to working in teams, thinking outside of the box. And in the book, I interview leaders from many other different industries, including hospitality and gyms and politics even and farming. And there are amazing stories of of ingenuity and lateral thinking that can come out of COVID-19, but also other crises. The book covers many different crises. I wrote the book to be a useful toolkit because I wanted people to have hope and realize that these things are, it is possible to navigate through. It's not easy, and you need to make some tough decisions. First and foremost, you need to take your people on the journey with you, but it is possible. Coming from the position of a TV executive, who's uh, a very wide-ranging experience, what makes running a creative business different from, say, a manufacturing business, and how can you apply those learnings when you do hit a crisis? The first thing that you must do is get your people to safety. And I've tried to highlight in the book that this book is aimed at people from across all industries and leaders, people who work in teams. So the first thing that we did in COVID and the first thing that we recommend you absolutely do is put your people first, which means getting people to safety. In the case of COVID-19, we moved people very early, 10 days before lockdown. We moved 1,500 logins off-site and online got people into their homes we made sure that kids were safe we made sure that elderly parents were safe that if there were people that were shielding they were safe so that's the first and most important thing you must do when you do that already you send a message out to your people that you care we then started a process of regular daily communication i started writing a letter every day many people were frightened We have a lot of young people working in our sector. They were alone at home. There was a lot of fear. I mean, I felt fear myself. So they needed to know that there was a voice in the darkness. At that time as well, it was very important to be authentic. You know, we didn't have all the answers. So I made sure that I communicated, first of all, in the email, and then we set up calls every single day between line managers and their teams saying, This is a really difficult, dark time. We do not have all the solutions, but know that we are with you. We are on site and we are looking solutions every single day. At the beginning, it was hour by hour and then day by day. And of course, the first thing we knew that we needed to do was get back into production. Now, it was at this point that I gathered around me an absolutely essential team. And this is, again, a chapter in the book. We set up a COBRA team. COBRA team, obviously, is what the British government used in terms of emergency. And I had a COBRA team of five very strong leaders in the business from all sectors, operations, creative, HR. These people are not yes people. They're tough business people who would tell me quite often what I didn't want to hear or what was painful to hear, but which I and we needed to listen to. One of the examples was Henry Scott, who runs Like a Shot, for example, very brilliant businessman. He was shooting all over the world. What he had done is he decided to accelerate filming in the 10 days before lockdown, fill up the edit suites with with as much great footage as we could possibly lay our hands on. And then we set about the process of getting back into production. And the way to do that with Like a Shot, who've got the long running show Abandoned Engineering, for example, is we decided we were going to find film crews all over the world who could shoot on our behalf. And initially there was some skepticism about, will we really find great shooters and directors and field producers in Guatemala and Zimbabwe and far flung parts of the planet? And of course, there are skilled people all over the world, but not all of them were ready to produce primetime British or American television. 
But we noticed that little by little, even right at the end of March 2020, lockdowns were starting to be lifted. So we started with that show, Abandoned Engineering, but also with the Leopard US show, House Hunters International. We started putting a grid together that we shared across the group about where in the world are COVID lockdowns lifting? Where can we find crews locally? Where can we train them up to produce primetime television? And, you know, there's going to be a benefit. Is one, we can produce shows. And two, we're going to stop using airlines and we're going to stop flying all over the world. In fact, we're continuing that now. It's much better for the climate. You know, this is just one example, for example, of, of how COVID forced us to think differently, got us to work collaboratively as a team, look for new systems, train people up, so upskill people around the planet and stop using airlines so, so frequently, which is better for the environment. You're in the business of creating and selling shows and selling them all around the world. What were your conversations like with all your key buyers, you know, with the networks and, and other partners around the world during this time? You're essentially saying that you really, for a, quite a significant period of lockdown, you kept on producing in different places in the world, essentially. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of fear, again, at the network. I mean, for example, we're talking to ITV. We had the Mars Singer lined up to shoot. We were talking to the BBC about Wurzel Gummidge and Mackenzie Crook was about to shoot. How Sunset International in the US, that's filming on every continent every single day of the week. All of these things were temporarily put on hiatus. Rumours flying around the industry back in the end of March 2020 that you know, nothing is going to be filmed in the whole year. Maybe we'll just delay everything till 21. Now, that for us is not an option. You know, if we don't film, we have no income, we don't have a business. And we knew that we needed to get our producers, both staff and freelancers, back into work. So we were laser focused really from day one on how do we get back into production? So we started working very closely, first of all, internally. How can we put together COVID protocols, which are going to be rock solid? What do we need to do to make sure our people are safe and can get out to film again? Then we found incredible collaboration across the industry. Pact, Producers Alliance of Cinema and Television, were fantastic. So was Creative UK. We worked very closely with BBC and ITV and Discovery in the US and others. But how can we put together, you know, a list as long as your arm of COVID protocols to make sure we can get out and shoot again? And initially there was some scepticism. There was some fear. You know, are you going to get sick if you do this? So we had to make sure we were absolutely belt and braces buttoned up. And lo and behold, we did. We got Mars Singer back on set very quickly. We were pretty much the first big studio show out of the gate. Wurzel Gummidge was back out. It was a, there was an advantage there that much of that was shot out in the countryside so people could be safe being out of doors. We created concentric bubbles around Mackenzie, around Vanessa Redgrave, around some of the leading stars to make sure people were safe. But we did get out, you know, we, and we were producing. So in that regard, it was just a, an extraordinary detailed team effort. Everybody rolled up their sleeves. We were all on the journey together and we made it happen. You mentioned earlier on the book features stories from leaders across different industries, such as hospitality and farming, who were also forced to find ways to survive and pivot through the crisis. Can you take us through some of those examples and perhaps some ideas of how the content industry can learn from them? One of the most inspiring people I spoke to is actually a political leader. He's a Republican in Oklahoma City called David Holt, who is the first Native American mayor of any American city, and he's 40. And I learned a lot from him about his method of communication. From the get-go, he was clearly pretty much diametrically opposed to the state governor of Oklahoma, who basically denied the fact that COVID even existed. In Oklahoma City, which is a diverse and growing urban centre, David Holt said, we are going to shut down we're going to shut all the bars. We are going to impose two metre distance. We're going to stop people going to schools and doing all the things that we did in the UK, but which was not happening in many of the red states in, in the middle of the US. He communicated very authentically about that and said to his people, I know this is difficult. I know it's painful, but come on the journey with us because we think this is in your best interests. And of course, people did follow the the rules. And you look at the fatality rates in Oklahoma City, they were far, far lower than Oklahoma State, and actually one of the lowest of any city in the United States. And David is a very humble man. He's a very inspiring leader. He said simply, you know, I had my people's best interests at heart, and I knew that people need to be protected, and we needed to intervene in that way. It was only temporary, it was for a month, but the fatality rates in Oklahoma City were far, far lower. 
So that for me is an example of really strong leadership, bravery and communicating with your people and, and saving people's lives, frankly. I think during that time, if we cast our minds back, we had various different leaders around the world, country leaders. We had EU were a lot slower than the UK government to develop the vaccine and pass the vaccine. We had Sweden, I think, that had a very different lockdown approach, as did New Zealand as well. And there were always lots of different voices, weren't there, from across the political spectrum, but also, you know, it was unprecedented. Nobody knew what the right thing to do was. So you're talking about strength of leadership, essentially, is what was key here. And people actually committed to leading in a particular way. That's right. And uh, we talked a little earlier about the Cobra team. For me, you know, I absolutely did not have all the answers. We were you know, devouring the news, of course, listening very, very carefully to what was being shared, not only in the UK, but also in the US and internationally. And also, you know, it's really important to have a diverse team built into your, into your organization. So when I put together my Cobra team, only five people, we then also had a, a larger team of 40 people from very different backgrounds, every possible hue, shade, color, religion, socioeconomic background, to make sure that you're getting people's ideas from across the country that you live in. Because, of course, people have different ways of dealing with things. And it was critical for us to listen to all of the options. And like I said, some of those options felt very difficult or painful. You didn't want to hear them. But it was essential that we put all the options on the table. And then the COBRA team, this kind of core team of five, we were able to go, you know what? We've now heard all the options. We can see all of the various ways we could go. Let's go for this, 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 and this. And then what is absolutely critical about the flexible method is once you've listened to all the options, you've done your homework, you must then follow those decisions through with fierce resolve. You make the decision and then you go for it 100% and you make it happen. Let nothing get in your way and you make sure you get to a positive outcome. That's absolutely critical. That requires bravery and guts. It's not easy. Absolutely. You say it's not easy. I mean, I I can imagine that even leaders across business when they were faced with with this challenge and as you say you know there's been lots of global crises over the past years and most notably the uh, 2008 financial crash and there was a passing concern when we saw silicon valley bank go down a couple of weeks ago and was there going to be a bank contagion happening um uh, you you're talking about you know strength of leadership and yes okay you make your decision but there must be times when you actually think when you're at home at night after you've made that decision 3 4 days ago there must be a creeping doubt that a leader gets was this the right call what if it's the wrong call i mean how do you silence those in your mind there are two sections in the book that are very important. And there are 16 steps, if you like, in the flexible method, which I've outlined. But two of them regard mental health. And the mental health of your team is absolutely vital. You have to put things in place to make sure your people have got support, that there's good communication, that people know that they can talk in a confidential space if they need to. So that's essential. But then in terms of a, of a leader, of course, it, you know, it's a, it's a cliche, but it's true. It can be lonely at the top. And you have to make sometimes decisions which which don't sit particularly comfortably. But if you've done your homework and if you've surrounded yourself with good people, then the likelihood is you will probably come to a good decision. At that point, you do put it into action and you see it through. But certainly looking after yourself as a leader, it's, it's you know, the idea of this kind of top down management style of the 80s is so outdated now. That's just so not how I operate. For me, it's about realizing that, you know, we've got big jobs, difficult jobs, which are amazingly creative and exciting. And I love it much of the time, but sometimes it's brutal and sometimes it can be painful and you have to look after yourself. You know, you need to surround yourself with good people and you need to exercise and you need to eat properly and you need to get into things like meditation or cycling, exercise, you know, um, read, you know, books that are going to keep you on the straight and narrow. You know, there are a lot of play with the dog, cook a meal, do, you know, lots of things to keep yourself sane. Because at times in the in the maelstrom, it can be very difficult to see the way through. We're seeing unprecedented change, James, in, in the TV industry right now. And young people are staying away from watching TV in their droves and turning their attention to social content, video gaming, etc. 
the TV industry, it's ultimately causing its its own crisis as a result of largely ignoring this growing problem for, for the past decade. How do you think the TV industry can address this going forward when its future is seemingly slipping away? I think we've been having this conversation for about 30 years. <laughs> There's always been a fear of new platforms cannibalizing existing platforms television is going to die and it's been about to die for on and off for 30 years. Then, you know, YouTube, then MySpace, then Facebook, then Facebook Watch. You know, there's this constant churn of new things coming online, some of them working and some of them not working. To be honest, I'm a content producer. And since the dawn of time, people have loved storytelling. And that's what we do. We tell great stories. We find amazing characters. We enter access to extraordinary worlds, whether it's in scripted or non-scripted. So, I embrace the fact that the world is constantly changing. I love the fact that we can produce an IMAX feature. We can produce a 10-part drama series. We can produce a a short series of short films for either TikTok or Snapchat. They're all different ways of telling stories, and they're all equally valid. I'm also not concerned about the rise, in fact, quite the opposite. I love the rise of gaming, and I love the fact that we've got VR coming down the track now. I'm very excited about this new way of interacting with content. And... We know that the audience loves to kind of move across platforms. We know that social media can really oxygenate. The Mars Singer, for example, that's got a number of different ways that you can interact with it. There's a television show, then there's all the social media stuff, there's, there's gaming, there's apps, there's a live show even. These things, they don't cannibalize each other. In fact, quite the opposite. They feed each other and they create a real sense of engagement for a very discerning audience. That's good. It's good for the content and it's good for the audience who want to engage. Surely when you're looking at, in particular, domestic broadcasters, we're seeing less and less advertising money into the industry and that that has a knock-on effect in terms of the amount of content and the tariffs that are being allocated to that reducing amount of content. I mean, how do you, as a leader of a TV business, that's working right across these platforms. I mean, how do you look ahead and adapt to this? Because presumably there's never going to be more money coming into traditional linear TV commissioning. How do you address that as a plier to those buyers? Okay, so, well, for starters, in the UK, we've got this very unique position of having the BBC. So I really hope the BBC can retain its independence and continue to be this hub of excellence because it's an absolute backbone of our industry. Separate to that, you know, you talk about the new ways of funding. We are deep in conversation with media agencies and advertising agencies in new ways of funding content. For example, Credit Suisse recently funded a fantastic film that Nemrin produced with Roger Federer, which is actually an art film. It's nothing to do with Federer as an athlete, although his humility and his um, genius comes through, but in a very unexpected way. But what's interesting about that film, it's a 45-minute film, and Credit Suisse do not appear in that film. They simply appear as a credit at the end. Why? It's because Federer, as a human and a professional, and indeed the the art journey he goes on, embodies some of the things that Credit Suisse aspire to, which is humility and quality. And if you work really hard in your life, you can be a winner. We're finding in the conversations we're having now with advertising agencies is that the audience don't really care for 30-second spots anymore. The age of those 30-second advertising commercials is really on on the way out. But brands need to engage with their audience. And audiences, especially Generation Z, they love brands and are very loyal to brands. So what can brands do? Well, they can invest in great storytelling and great content, which embodies the essence of what the brand stands for. Obviously, we've seen that with Red Bull and there are others. And many, many brands are coming down the track. And what I'm particularly excited about is that these brands frequently have very strong ethical values. So climate change, for example, and diversity and inclusion, which are two absolute bedrocks of who Argonon is, they are essential to a number of brands, especially young brands, where consumers want to know that there are core values in this brand with which they identify. So so that aligns with what we're trying to do. It aligns with with what the brand is trying to do. And it's providing a service, if you like, for the consumer who wants to engage. So this is a new way of producing content. It is clear to me there's a lot of money in brands. There's a lot of money to be invested in content. So I'm not worried about funding sources at all. 
And now it's time in the show for Story of the Week, where James gets to nominate the TV industry news story that's caught his eye in the past seven days. James, what's your story of the week? Okay, for me, I think it has to be TikTok. You know, what an incredible platform. And it's provided so much amazing entertainment and laughs and engagement for millions of us all over the world. It's also produced incredible talent. On TikTok, we found this terrific talent called Laron Hines in Mississippi, uh, who created a show called um, Are You Smarter Than a Preschooler? It went viral, and Laron then found himself at the Golden Globes. And it's talent like him who probably might never have come to light if TikTok hadn't existed. So I know there are security issues and things. I'm no politician. That's not my job. Uh, but I do hope that they find a way through because I think TikTok is a terrific platform. Yeah, well, its its growth has been absolutely phenomenal, hasn't it? It was really fueled, I think, throughout the COVID crisis, you know, that growth that it's experienced. And now it's pretty much the preeminent content that young people are watching. And you see lots of opportunity with TikTok going forward, James. I, I hope so. I mean, for example, Laurent Hines, the young guy we met, he was 17 at the time. He was doing auditions in Los Angeles. He'd been picked up by singer-songwriter Robin Thicke as a major rising star. And then COVID hit and suddenly the whole of Hollywood shut down. And so Laurent found himself back in Mississippi. His mom runs a daycare centre and said, look, you're a 17-year-old boy. I'm not having you hanging around the house twiddling your thumbs. Come and work in the daycare centre. Of course, you know, this was his idea of hell. But what did he do? Well, he decided, well, you know, the kids in the daycare centre are very entertaining. I'm going to start shooting some little films called Are You Smarter Than a Preschooler? And I'm going to put them onto TikTok, which is obviously a free platform for anybody and everyone. And they immediately went viral. People loved it. And on the back of that, you know, Robin Thicke said, Look, now come back to Hollywood. He was invited onto the Golden Globes. And it's been a platform for him to get his talent out there. And I love the fact that in the world we live in now, broadcasters are obviously very important but you can also broadcast yourself and i love that yeah it's a, a real democratization of opportunity isn't it it's low the the barrier to entry for lots of very talented people james now it's time for you to nominate your hero of the week and let us know who or what you're telling to get in the bin who's your hero of the week okay so i'm going to name king charles i'm quite a fan actually and the reason for that is that he is a real beacon of hope for sustainability. You know, we need a leader in the world who takes climate change seriously. We've got a severe climate crisis on our hands and we need strong, powerful people at the top who will demonstrate that this is an emergency, that we collectively have to work together and we have to start changing our behaviours. And one thing I will say about King Charles is that he has proven in his farming, that sustainability is possible and has come up with some very innovative ideas. So, of course, this week we heard that his trip to France has been cancelled, which is, which is a shame. I'm a keen Europhile. I'm sorry to hear what's happening in France. He's switched now to go to Germany, which is a good thing. And in Germany, you know, they are extraordinary in manufacture and in a lot of green initiatives. He's going to be doing a lot of meeting uh, some key players in the green environmental space in Germany. And that will increase awareness and it will continue to keep you know, the climate crisis at the top of the agenda. And so good for him. You know, it's more crucial than ever for the future of the monarchy that he's seen to be apolitical, but maybe paints him in a, in a unique position globally. He has to remain unbiased, essentially, but therefore it gives him a, a unique position to apply pressure in that soft power uh, that the monarchy has in a way that can be beneficial to everybody, which is it's an interesting thought, isn't it? He's made the decision that he has to be less political, perhaps, about climate change than he was before he became king. And I understand that now he will need to follow his instructions as per the government, because that's our constitution, isn't it? But nonetheless, the fact is that he is known to be a sustainable farmer, and he's been a campaigner in this space for many, many years. And I understand in Germany, he will be, for example, going on a, an electric powered boat to demonstrate, you know, the power of using electricity rather than diesel fuel. So, yeah, he will be limited in, in some of the things he can do. And he has to be less political because that's that's his job. I do get that. But at the same time, he does stand for somebody who cares about the climate. And we need more people in taking that position. Yeah. And the coronation, not far away. An interesting uh, 
televisual experience, isn't it? I think this is not something that not many of us in our lifetime have experienced. That's going to be a talking point when we get into uh, May. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to get the whole country in an absolute frenzy of excitement. Uh, It's obviously a big day for the country. And uh, how about going in the bin, James? Who or what are you telling to get in the bin this week? Okay, so I am really interested in politics. And I'm regretful to hear that ITVX, for example, has decided to stop transmitting Spitting Image. And I know that Mock the Week was cancelled last year. And I think there is a place in our schedules for really strong, very funny political satire. One good bit of news is that Have I Got News For You has been recommissioned for a record 65th season. Uh, And I do hope that uh, other channels may feel, you know, the political debate, especially when it's funny, is critical for a democratic society. Uh, It's good fun. It allows us to speak openly about what we truly think about things. It it encourages authenticity. It, It encourages people to have a range of views, which is healthy. And just basically, it's really, really good entertainment. So I hope there'll be more coming down the track. I think it's proof of that when successive governments and people of all political persuasions are are generally a little bit uncomfortable when it comes to satire, because that means it's doing its job, right? And that means it's uh, speaking that sort of truth to power. James, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. The Flexible Method is out today. Tell us uh, how we grab a copy. So the book launches today and it's available on Amazon. You can also get it as an e-book and an audio book. I really hope that people will download the book and write some comments as well for me and some reviews because I want this to become a conversation. There's so much to learn and we did a lot of things right. There's also things to improve that we can do moving forward. So I really hope it will engage an audience in a, in a wider conversation for the long term. Best of luck with it, James. Thanks for coming on Telecast and we'll see you very soon. Thanks so much. See ya. Well, that's about it from me for another week. This week's show was recorded in London and edited by Ian Chambers. We're taking a break for a couple of weeks over the Easter holidays. The next telecast show is out on Thursday the 20th of April when we're in Cannes for MIP TV. Until then, stay safe.